I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Manscaped. Hey, are you looking for the ultimate stocking stuffers for this holiday season? Look no further because our sponsors, Manscaped, have the tools to make you win this year's stocking stuffer or white elephant competition. That's right. Manscaped is the only brand dedicated to below the waist grooming and hygiene products. And great news, they just released their products across Europe, Canada, and Australia. Manscaped has been a long time sponsor at Donut. I really like their products. It might be silly, but these things are super high quality. Everything from their lawnmower 3.0 trimmer to their, uh, their ball toner. It's good stuff, okay? And guess what? This stuff, just because it's called Manscaped, doesn't mean that women can't use it too, all right? This is everybody scaped. A few of their products that are prime stocking stuffers this season are the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. The name speaks for itself. Give it to your dad. That'd be hilarious. The Crop Reviver Ball Toner, a spray-on toner that will give your balls a little slice of heaven with their aloe vera and hazel extracts. That sounds very nice. Uh, the Crop Cleanser Body Wash, a full body wash that you can also use on your hair. I, this stuff's actually really good. I like the, the Crop Cleanser a lot. Also, the Crop Mop ball wipes who wouldn't want that in their stocking you know you never know when the opportunity strikes you should always be prepared keep your balls uh <laughs> clean <laughs> guess what guys they got the new foot duster foot deodorant give that to your grandma designed to keep the stankiest of feet smelling fresh they've also got the shears 2.0 it's, it's a luxury four-piece nail kit that's actually a great stocking stuffer maybe you got like a high schooler who's like a junior you know that's about the time when I got one of these kind of Shears 2.0 kits. There's also the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer, which provides proprietary skin safe technology to get rid of those nasty nose hairs. I've used mine a few times, gets the job done. I'm actually gonna give one of these to my dad, for real. And let's not forget about the best trimmer for your butt, balls, and body. The Lawn Mower 3.0 Trimmer offers a replaceable ceramic blade with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce grooming accidents. This thing's great. I really love the Lawn Mower 3.0. And guess what? Great thing is all these formulations are all vegan, cruelty-free, dye-free, sulfate-free, and paraben-free, so you know the products are legit. That's really cool. I actually did not know that until I read this sponsorship. How, how, how about that? Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code GAS20. 20 gas 20 gas 20 uh, whether this is for your partner your dad your brother your friend get them something that they will actually use and that's pretty much guaranteed to get a laugh practical funny and affordable get 20 percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code gas 20 be the ballsiest gift giver this year with manscaped always a pleasure manscaped thank you in March of 2009, the Formula One world gathered in Barcelona, Spain for the annual pre-season testing. It was normally an event that would have attracted little attention, but amidst a global recession, an unlikely new challenger had arrived in the midst of billion dollar teams like Red Bull and Ferrari. The new team was represented by a plain white car with black and neon yellow highlights, known as the BGP001. Unlike every other F1 car, it was entirely free of sponsorship stickers besides a single Bridgestone tire decal because the car wasn't yet sponsored. Weirder still was the mystery car's performance. It was faster than anything else on the track. The various F1 teams were full of dismissive theories. At first, the circuit officials dismissed the lap times, thinking that the driver had cut through a chicane. Others thought that the car was running light on fuel to try to put up a deceptively fast time to attract sponsors. Eventually, though, everyone realized the unreal event they were witnessing was real. A team that had blinked into existence out of nowhere now appeared to have the fastest car in Formula One. The garage cleared out as half of the mechanics ran back to place internet bets on the new team's prospects. The name they bet on? Braun GP. Today on Pass Gas, the most unlikely underdog story in the entire history of Formula One, 2009's Braun GP. How did an entire F1 team get bought for a single British pound? Why did the team burn through dozens of sponsors, including a Christian Bale movie and a medical grade brand of shampoo? And what can the fairy tale single season saga of Braun GP teach us about the past, present, and future of Formula One? All that and more on a mysterious, all new podcast that truly came out of nowhere. It's Pass Gas. Pass Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Okay, I'm going to begrudgingly move right past uh, medical grade shampoo. 
because I <laughs> I don't want and I know maybe some of our listeners have scalp problems and uh, I don't want to make fun of it even though I really 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 do want to make fun of it. But like this is a story that you like sometimes when I'm like going to bed or something like I'll have these like just like crazy fantasies, you know, just like what if I woke up tomorrow and I was just like so good at skateboarding, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or like it just like this doesn't happen ever like someone to just show up and or like like oh man what if like you just like show up to like to the nba and you're just like the best yeah Yeah. you know this is like the equivalent of that but it's it's like there's so much or millions of dollars in this sport that it truly makes it so much more impossible than just walking on to like an eagles tryout or like Uh uh-huh oh for sure nba tryout I used to have these fantasies when I was a kid that I could do like really sick parkour. And uh, this is like, oh, what if like someone like started a fight in my fifth grade classroom? What I would do is I would jump and run off the desk and then run along the whiteboard yeah. and then like kick I've the guy in the face. I've had those before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like. So, and, but yeah, it's like <laughs> if you had the skill, like not only is it you have the skill, which is awesome. But you have the control to keep the skill a secret and yeah. not seek any sort of uh, like um, gain or, or praise for it. You're just like, it's the discussion we had about dancing. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, if yeah. I were if I was just like awesome at dancing and like no one really knew it, I had my same still my same life. And it's like, no, James is like like New York ballet level. <laughs> yeah. He went to Juilliard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's so humble that he never brings yeah, it up in conversation. He knows that he'd be too powerful if he always showed off the dancing. Well, yeah, and it's like he he just like prefers uh, cars and comedy. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> yeah. that's what, that's what he likes more. That's his real passion. He's blessed with dancing, but he loves cars <laughs> and comedy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, I guess we should just get into it. I'm really excited today because. Uh, uh, it's another F1 story. It's a modern F1 story uh, with names that we recognize and some who are still competing today. Tell us who we are. <laughs> we are P- Past Gas by Donut Media. My name is Nolan Sykes, and I'm joined as always by my two good friends and co hosts, uh, James Pumphrey. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the best one you've ever done. That's because I have the mic. <laughs> you gotta use the mic. <laughs> You got to peek Whoa, a little bit. That sounds insane. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe Weber. Fart up. There we go. We are the, the voices you are hearing right now. <laughs> we are the voices you are hearing right now. Welcome. Welcome to our our twisted world of automotive history. <laughs> Nolan, I think you're like 3% too hot. Okay. Well, I've been told that before. <laughs> I'd say he's about 5% too hot. <laughs> I mean, if I knew how to dance, I'd definitely be like 10% too hot. You'd That's be 150% sure. too hot, bro. Ooh. I always get way too hot when I try to dance. <laughs> As we saw this week. It's perfect that you like tried to get good at it for a summer years ago because you know just enough to be yeah. awful. <laughs> to look yeah. like you, yeah. Oh, man, I danced for four minutes maybe, and I was out of breath for the next hour. <laughs> yeah, we we filmed these spots for uh, Omaze, a sponsor on our YouTube channel. We were given away a Dodge Demon, which is really sick. Joe tries to do some break dancing uh, in costume, in character uh, as Doug Demon, and it was hilarious because, like, yeah, James, you were saying like he knows just enough, like your little warm up, like. Like uh, top rock, yeah, just yeah. around the box for like a minute was like really funny. <laughs> oh, we took a picture of Joe in costume, like in the engine bay of my Corolla, and I put it on Instagram and said, "I'm demon swapping the Corolla." Like nobody got obviously it. Obviously, a joke. Yeah. Nobody got it. Yeah. Like half the people were like, "Oh my god, that's so sick," and then the <laughs> other half of the people were like, "I don't think you should, man. I think it's going to really go against the soul of the car." Oh my god. Some of the context Get is <laughs> lost because Joe is not dressed as a traditional demon. You're wearing like a cutoff flannel shirt and oh, uh, he's not a traditional demon. Some <laughs> Iowa spec jeans and a dark mall <laughs> <skull> cap. <laughs> Iowa spec. Oh my god! I didn't know okay. you're such a demon purist, Nolan. No, I'm just. Oh well. I mean, I I know demons, dude. So what's like, what is a traditional demon? I would say very spindly in shape, 
Um, well, that's just don't fat shame Joe. Yeah, man. No, I'm saying like <laughs> <laughs> don't body shame Joe. <laughs> Joe's in fine shape, okay? Look, I can't just because of my genes, I can't grow goat legs. All right, <laughs> that's a genetic thing, dude. Hey, sorry, I'm not spindly enough for you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That concludes our backpacker discussion of the week. Uh, Let's get into Braun GP. So many times in racing history, a crash has meant the end of a story. But on today's episode, a crash is where it all begins. (laughs) Uh, Specifically, we're talking about the financial crash, the biggest in world history. The year was 2008 and global markets were in full meltdown mode. Uh, I believe everybody listening to this podcast, uh, myself included, and everyone in this show was affected by it. The auto industry was among the worst affected. In December, uh, Takio Fukui, Honda's CEO at the time, took the stage at a Tokyo news conference. His company's sales were down over 30%, and uh, a little side effect of that was uh, Honda's decision to withdraw from Formula One effective immediately. As disappointing as the news was for F1 fans, you couldn't exactly blame Honda for quitting. In the previous F1 season, Honda had placed ninth out of the 10 teams. Yikes. Their drivers, the Brazilian Rubens Barrichello and the British Jensen Button, had placed 14th and 18th respectively in the final point standings, uh, which as an F1 fan, not impressive. Not only was the team performing poorly, spending in F1 was, by all accounts, out of control. During the 2008 season, Formula One's teams spent a combined $1.6 billion just to field their cars, about $150 million a team. Honda's budget was even higher than the average. Some estimates out there put it at $300 million per year, or the price of 20,000 base model Honda Civics. Dude, I would have to host 300 videos on <laughs> just to have an f1 team that's crazy man wow that'd be so hard for you i know that's like i don't think i i don't know if i've hosted that many anyway <laughs> anyway <laughs> honda's withdrawal meant that the team was now up for sale gentlemen it was a disappointing end for honda which had only rejoined f1 as a team in 2006 just two years before after spending decades as an engine supplier for other teams, I will say sporadically, they weren't they weren't in F1 all the way through. Honda kind of has a history of um, showing up for a little bit, supplying engines, and then kind of quitting. It, they have a very weird relationship with the sport. They just uh-huh. quit again, right? Yeah, they're going to be out. They're going to be out uh, as of the end of this year, I believe, which means Red Bull will probably... Uh, license the engine design and keep working on it, but they won't have the support from Honda, which will be kind of uh, not good. We'll see how that works out. So the team had had a strange history, having gone through previous iterations as British American Racing or BAR, and before that they were called Tyrell Racing. This meant while the team was Japanese owned, it was based in Brackley, UK and mostly staffed by British employees. With the sale of the team, the stakes were much higher than pounds and yen. The Honda F1 team employed over 700 people, and if the team folded, all of them would be out of the job in the midst of a terrible recession. When Honda's chief operating officer, Hiroshi Oshima, broke the news of Honda's withdrawal uh, to team management just days before the public announcement, the usually composed businessman was near tears. To make matters more painful, Honda's team, led by Principal Ross Braun and CEO Nick Fry, had reason to believe that the 2009 season had a potential to be a breakthrough year for the team. They were just completing development on a brand new car called the RA109 with aerodynamic innovations the team believed would make Honda competitive again. In anticipation of Oshima's visit, Fry and Braun had worked out a plan to cut 30% from the yearly budget. But Oshima was firm. Honda simply couldn't afford to stay in Formula One. That's a bummer. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar company. I think they're all right. Braun and Fry came out of the meeting stunned. They both understood how important racing was to Honda's heritage and how grim the situation must be at Japanese headquarters if they were willing to scuttle the program altogether. When the two Brits broke the news to the rest of the F1 principals at a meeting of the Formula One team's association, the most powerful players of F1 were equally shaken. But a rare camaraderie emerged. 
Before Honda, Ross Braun had worked as technical director at Ferrari for a decade. He was uh, one of the big players responsible for Michael Schumacher's um, yes. dominance. He was one of the first like non-Italians to be technical director, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, and as such, he had a very strong relationship with Luca de Montezamolo, who was the chairman of Ferrari. Montezamolo offered to let Braun use Ferrari engines in 2009 to keep the team in competition, which when uh, you look back at Ferrari, that's like, that's an exceedingly rare olive branch there. Usually Ferrari does supply other teams with engines. This year they supply Haas F1, they supply uh, Alfa Romeo, of course, and there's one more um crap i can't remember skiglio's hmm skiglio 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 yeah yeah sure skiglio automobile skiglio <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a it's a big bowl of skungili um <laughs> skiglio <laughs> he's made of linguini yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um in F1, like uh, if a team like Ferrari is supplying other teams with their engines, those teams almost act as like feeder teams for the main Ferrari team. So it's very strange that they would uh, kind of break that tradition and offer an engine to a team like this former Honda team because there's no prior uh, relationship there. So when Braun later broke the news of Honda's withdrawal to the team's gathered employees, he spoke in inspirational tones about the group finding a buyer for the team to keep things going but the reality was much darker what kind of company or investor could afford to take on a 200 million dollar f1 team in the middle of a recession no less we just found out that i could not yeah <laughs> so if james can imagine okay braun was forced to make huge staffing cuts he fired half of the workforce which was a devastating blow even for those who managed to hold on to their jobs. The firing meant that the team was now a skeleton crew of only those employees that were essential for race day. Next, like their F1 version of a rom-com bad date montage, Braun and Fry met with a series of dubious financial suitors. The first potential buyer was Vijay Malia, an Indian playboy billionaire who already owned an F1 team, the newly created Force India, which is now known as Racing Point today. Curious about a possible merger, he invited the ex-Honda principals to his castle, which was located near Silverstone. Fry was amused to discover that Vijay's castle was, in fact, what it was called an eye-catcher. It looked like the castle from the front with spires and turrets, but from the side, it was just a regular old building. <laughs> kind of like a facade in a frontier town, which is amazing. According to Fry, it perfectly summed up Vijay's prospect as a partner, Lots of flash, but not much to back it up. I love frontier towns, like with saloons and, <laughs> yeah. and general stores and stuff like that. That's my jam. You were born in the wrong time. Oh, things used to be better in 1872. That's what I always say, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Make America 1872 again. <laughs> Next up was Achilles Kalakis, a Greek businessman who would later be jailed for the biggest loan fraud in British history. He referred to himself as Ambassador of the Republic of San Marino. San Marino's flag isn't red, but it may as well have been. Kalakis was a bust. <laughs> hey. Achilles Kalakis. Kalakis. <laughs> Increasingly desperate, Fry and Braun even met with a representative of Richard Branson, the billionaire owner of the Virgin Group. The car was sponsored by Virgin. We'll get to that. <sighs> There's a little bump wait. in the road first. Though. I this can't the... wait. <laughs> James, your encyclopedic knowledge of Formula One once again <laughs> destroys a story point <laughs> in an episode. I can't help but talk about it. I gotta <laughs> spill the beans. <laughs> uh... Braun and Fry were not impressed when the rep threatened that, quote, If Richard buys the team and finds out you two are a pair of Muppets, he will get rid of you very quickly. Needless to say, Feed you to the pigs. Needless to say, British F1 guys don't like being called Muppets, and their relationship <laughs> with Virgin was not yet consummated. Although Branson would later come on board as a sponsor. Oh, I blew that. Spoiler spoiler. Uh, I, <laughs> Muppets is not a, um, an insult that I was familiar with, but it's a good one. 
Like if no, someone yeah. called me a Muppet, I'd either be like, what, dude? Or I'd be like, oh, man. <laughs> What's like, worse, it, though, Muppet or a puppet? Because Muppets are pretty, like, endearing. I think they're totally different. Like if, like, if someone calls you a puppet, like, yeah. you're a f- <laughs> punk, dude. Yeah. Like, you're someone else is controlling you. But, like, a Muppet, a Muppet is more broad, and you're just a dope, I think. Yeah. Like, you f- <laughs> Muppet. <laughs> So, what comes after a bad date montage in a rom-com? Well, the protagonists discovered that the whole time they were searching for the right partner, the person they really had to find was themselves. Mm-hmm. For Ross Braun, this meant an MBO. Oh, you mean like male body odor? No, <laughs> James. Which Manscaped can help you out with, by the way. Proud sponsor of Pass Gas. Now, MBO means management buyout, meaning... What if we bought it ourselves? It was an idea born of desperation, but the more Braun and Fry considered it, the more it seemed like it could work. It would save Honda from the financial burden of firing the entire staff of 700 people and paying them severance. It would also give them the option to get back an F1 at a later date uh, if the economic picture improved. Honda agreed and sold the F1 operation to Ross Braun for the nominal sum of one British pound. <laughs> Who knew that F1 had a dollar meal? <laughs> <laughs> By the time the deal was finalized, it was March 6, 2009, just three weeks before the first race of the F1 season. A name had to be chosen for the X Honda team, and fast. The quick conclusion was that the only name worthy of the brand new team was that of the man who had saved it from doom. And thus, despite a bit of embarrassment on Ross Braun's part, yeah, right. His team would now be known as Braun GP. No, he like didn't want it to be called that. I think they really missed an opportunity with this. Well, why? Why? Because like this never happens. Like it's always like a huge company. Like what are the other team names? Uh, Ferrari, Mercedes, Red Bull, even. But like, you don't have any sponsors. Name it like something sick, like one pound or something like that. Or yeah, Rub it just in like. Their face. <laughs> just or just like skin yeah. fantastic GP. Yeah. <laughs> Brains and bronze. <laughs> yeah, or just like fantastic GP. Fantastic uh, GP is pretty good. Yeah. Fantastic's a great word. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, fan that's perfect. Oh, that's oh fantastic. fantastic. You're fantastic. What about free beer? How about that for a team name? Free yeah, beer. yeah. Yeah. D- yeah. That's better. Like <laughs> free beer GP. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the financial crisis, it was a year of change as F1 introduced some of the biggest regulation changes in decades. Slick tires were legal for the first time since 1998, and the season also saw the introduction of the Kinetic Energy Recovery System, or CASE. That's how you say it. (laughs) That allowed cars to store energy from braking. The face of the league was also changing, as the previous season had seen the emergence of a guy named Lewis Hamilton as he became the youngest ever F1 champion in the sport's history. Sebastian Vettel had also made a splash, literally, by winning at a rainy Italian Grand Prix, becoming the youngest driver to win an F1 race at the age of 21 and two months. All of that was the picture that Braun GP was driving into, and within the changing landscape, Braun fit right in by standing out. Aesthetically, the Braun cars were visually striking like no F1 car before them. Rebranded as the BGP-001, they sported a plain white paint job with fluorescent yellow highlights. During preseason testing, they almost looked like minimalist concept art of an F1 car from the future, especially compared to the garishly multicolored, multi-branded F1 cars occupying the remainder of the paddock. The look of the car perfectly encapsulated the team's bare bones, underdog origins. Everything was stripped away except the race car and the driver. Speaking of drivers, piloting the two brawn cars were Jensen Button and Rubens Barrichello. Button had been waiting for his luggage at a baggage claim at the London airport when he received a call that Honda was leaving F1. At that point, he had figured his F1 days had come to an abrupt end. Now, just like the team, he had been brought back from the brink. Technically speaking, Braun, like most other F1 teams, opted not to employ a curse system. They felt it was too much of an unknown. The team was pleasantly surprised at the performance of their car, especially the handling and downforce. The biggest edge Braun had over other cars was the rear diffuser. 
New regulations had reduced the maximum size of F1 diffusers in an attempt to reduce downforce across the board, but Braun had found a loophole in the rule by designing a so-called double-decker diffuser, which added a second diffuser to the crash structure of the car. The tail of the diffuser became a big part of the Braun GP myth, but recent interviews with Braun engineers reveal a slightly more complicated story. John Owen, the principal aerodynamicist, explained that the double diffuser only gave an advantage of 0.3 seconds per lap in testing. The main benefit was actually the stability it allowed during testing. As other ingredients of the aero package were modified, like the front wing and the deflectors over the rear brakes, the double diffuser didn't have to be tweaked. It just worked with whatever setup the team tested. Red Bull actually copied the diffuser and, much to Braun's amusement, found that it barely helped their times. According to James Vowles, the chief strategist for Braun, it just made us chuckle inside because it caused them to be distracted away from the primary goal of adding downforce to the car. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, like, what are your hobbies, James Vowles? Pheasant hunting, dog <laughs> training. Yeah. Uh, Truffle hunting with me pig. Safaris, digging for truffles. And chasing birds in London. It's what we call women. Oh, those kind of birds. Given that the development budget <laughs> had been enormously slashed after Honda's withdrawal, it was just the kind of smokescreen that Braun GP needed to stay competitive during the season. The last piece was the engine. In addition to Ferrari, Mercedes had also offered Braun the use of their engine for the season. After assessing both options, the team determined that Mercedes was a better fit since its layout more closely resembled the Honda it was replacing. Given the Frankenstein nature of the car's design, Nick Fry set a top five finish in the Constructors' Championship as the goal. He never imagined that the team's potential would far exceed his wildest expectations. Yeah, at the time, Mercedes was, uh, like today, AMG Patronus is obviously the, ver the top team. Uh, they're dominating everything. Also, sickest name. Very cool name. Um, but at the time, they were the engine supplier for, uh, they, were, they were working with McLaren. McLaren, Mercedes, ooh, I want to <laughs> take it down to Kokomo. We'll get there fast and then we'll, we'll still go it. fast. <laughs> we drive really fast. <laughs> we're going to kick your <laughs> AMG. And Patronus, <laughs> McLaren, and Mercedes. <laughs> That's where we want to go. Straight down to Monaco. <laughs> okay. That's, yep. We got to make that song. Driving on the track. If we don't win, we won't come back. <laughs> I love poker. So I got super excited when I found out that the World Series of Poker actually has their own app where you can play poker with people from around the world. I can literally play poker 24 hours a day if I want to. For me, it's Hold'em. I love Hold'em. I also love Pineapple. I love Omaha. I love it all. But Hold'em is like my rock. And you know, I've always wanted to play in the actual World Series of Poker. So like this is the next best thing to that. But what's cool about this World Series of Poker app is that you don't have to actually pay 10,000 bucks like in the real world to buy in. It's free to download, but you don't have to put money into it. It's actually the number one poker app out there. It has tons of players online to match up against whenever you want to play poker, which is for me is 24 hours a day. Did I mention that? And there's like a ton of like cool fun events that happen around the holidays. So you want to download this before. Best of all, when you join right now, you get 1 million chips as a bonus gift. What would you spend a million chips on? This is the official World Series of Poker app, so you know it's legit. There's like cash games, there's tournaments, you can uh, connect via your Facebook account, set up a virtual table with your friends. That's super cool because like we're all supposed to be home anyways. Why not just hang out with your friends, play poker at the same time? So what's the holdup? Download the WSOP app in the Apple Store or Google Play and on Amazon Now. And don't forget to use my promo code WSOPGAS for 1 million bonus chips when you sign up. That's WSOPGAS, as in World Series of Poker, gas, as in past gas. You know what I'm talking about? Thank you, World Series of Poker. I've been thinking about making some personal changes lately. I wanted to start by improving my self-care routine. The problem was, I had no idea where to start. Then I found Hawthorne. 
Whether you're treating yourself or shopping for someone on your list this year, finding the right holiday gift is never easy. But this holiday season, Hawthorne is making gift giving fun and simple. Guys, Hawthorne is a premium tailored personal care brand that's making it easy for guys to feel and smell their best. Let me tell you, it's a fun little process they got going on, okay? Hawthorne all starts with a quiz. They ask you things like, uh, What's your favorite drink? Mine's an old fashioned. Uh, how do you like to spend a night out? Do you smoke, etc.? Their algorithm sorts through all of these answers that you give them and chooses the right products for you based on what you tell them. It's actually really fun. Took me like five minutes. Turns out I'm just a introvert that likes to drink. So how they were able to match me with these products so well. You know, that's some algorithm magic right there. Uh, the products I got, I got a lot of them from Hawthorne, okay? But some of my favorites are the Foamless Shampoo and their hair conditioner. This is some good stuff. It really uh, makes my hair very soft. Healthy feeling hair, curls are accentuated. Guys, we don't really take care of our hair as much as we should. Okay, having good shampoo that's tailored to your hair is uh, really awesome. You also get to build personalized gifts for everyone on your list. Maybe your dad has really dry skin. They've got some really good lotion that I use every day. Uh, maybe your brother needs to step up his cologne game, okay? They've also got colognes out there. Maybe your mom just wants a candle for the house. You could do that, they have candles. Hawthorne is a fun and convenient way to get super high quality products tailored specifically for men. Hawthorne even takes the risks out of it by giving you free shipping on your order and returns. And if you don't like the products, they'll even retailer them based on your feedback. It's really awesome. So get special offers for the holidays going on right now by visiting hawthorne.co, hawthorne.co and use promo code GAS to get 10% off your first purchase. Hawthorne.co and use promo code GAS to get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you again, Hawthorne. That's hawthorne.co. So I got a question for you. What interferes with your happiness? I know that's like a big question, but for me, it's a lot of things. It's mostly stress. It's the stress of not being able to hang out with my family, working too much, big stress ball. But good thing we have companies like BetterHelp, which will assess your needs and match you with a licensed professional therapist to help you out. It's super convenient and private. You just meet online in a private online environment and you can start communicating within 24 hours. This isn't like a self-help thing. It's professional counseling. This is real good help that you can get. Everyone needs help. Everyone needs a therapist. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. You can send a message to your counselor at any time. And when you message them, you'll get thoughtful responses on time. You can schedule weekly meetings whenever you want. And there's no uncomfortable waiting room that you just have to stew in. You know what I'm talking about? If you don't find your right therapist, that's totally fine. BetterHelp will find you a better match. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. Finding the right therapist for you is very important. And that's what BetterHelp is there for. Plus, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. This is available worldwide. You can be in freaking Kalamazoo or freaking South Africa, Russia. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're suffering from. You can be suffering from depression, stress, anxiety, relationship stress, family conflicts, anger, grief, anything. They'll help you with it. And everything you share is confidential. No leaks. It's convenient, it's professional, it's affordable. There's really no reason that you shouldn't use BetterHelp. So I and everyone else at Donut want you to start living a happier life. As a listener, you get 10% off your first month if you go to the website betterhelp.com slash passgas. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash passgas. Better H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Uh, the 2009 season kicked off in <laughs> Melbourne, 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 Australia, at Albert Park uh, for the Australian Grand Prix. Down Under was the perfect place for the season to begin, given that the entire sport had been turned on its head by the events of the past few months. The Braun GP cars were now a little less minimalist than before. The same man who questioned the team's competence earlier, Mr. Sir Richard Branson, <laughs> Mr. Sir, <laughs> <laughs> agreed to a sponsorship deal, and now the cars sported Virgin logos. According to Fry, Branson actually caused a bit of a stir at Albert Park when he flirted with driver Jensen Button's girlfriend after going, quote, hard at the pink champagne for quite a while the eve of race day 
Oh, lots of talent here in this paddock. Oh, lots of good talent here in this paddock. <laughs> uh, apparently, that was just what Button needed to get fired up. He won the race the next day with teammate Rubens Barrichello coming in second place. What a debut for this team, man. Braun Mercedes had scored a 1-2 finish in their first ever Formula 1 race. Button had led for all 58 race or 58 laps, excuse me. The first time an F1 team had won its debut race since Juan Manuel Fangio and Mercedes had won in the 1954 French Grand Prix. Wow. wow. I mean, imagine being Jensen. Imagine being Jensen at that point too. You went from 18th, yeah. you finished the season in 18th the previous yeah, year. Yeah, and then you thought you were done. You thought you were done because by you all got, accounts you were at an like, airport and you were like, I guess I'm done. I just flew economy. I'm waiting for my bags. <laughs> Nothing can get worse than this. <laughs> how is what what's how old is he at this point? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm, he's like a, he's not a young chicken at this point. He's But like is he if if Honda just went away, would another team have brought him on? Do you think? Let's see. Let's see how old but he was. He was like he was like twenty eight at this time. Oh yeah, I mean then he still had. Career. He had a chance. He'd probably be like um, he'd probably be like a Nico Hulkenberg at this point, kind of like okay. someone who obviously had a lot of promise, but like the seats, the the musical chairs that is Formula One, there probably wouldn't be a seat available for him, and he he. he Probably would have a chance of coming back at some point if a team needed a, a veteran, experienced driver who didn't have too high of a price tag. Uh, yeah. yeah, this was really a saving grace for him, for sure. The team that just weeks before had been the subject of charitable offers from both Mercedes and Ferrari had now come back to life and beat them on the track with a 1-2 finish to boot. The scrappy attitude went across all aspects of the team. Instead of finding a main sponsor, the team settled on a strategy of securing a different deal for every race. Where Honda had sent as many as 120 personnel to each race, Braun cut the staff down to just 40. This was F1 on a budget. That's insane. Only 40 people yeah. at the race. Uh, I'm not sure how many uh, people that, like modern F1 teams have, but that just seems like a really small amount of people. Mm-hmm. Braun just making it to the race was wildly against the odds, but it was still a somber moment for the team in Australia, knowing that back home in England, hundreds of people who had lost their jobs with Honda were hearing the news of the team's victory with what must have been a complicated mix of emotions. Ross Braun, who is normally a stoic man, seemed to understand the emotion of the moment, descending from the podium, still soaked with champagne, to give hugs to the team members who had gathered for the victory ceremony. Those kind of hugs are like nice because you're like emotionally at a great place but when when you're in the moment you're like yeah i guess i'll hug you <laughs> and it's like yeah you're gross and wet and i you don't smell like booze and i have to drive home bummer. yeah <laughs> the next race was the malaysian grand prix which i wish was still on the calendar it's not unfortunately i love malaysia that's a great track what's what's the track called uh that is the uh, hold on hold on oh kuala lumpur Really cool track. Uh, Jensen Button qualified in pole position. The tropical weather played a very heavy factor. Although the race was scheduled to be 56 laps, it was called after 31 laps due to a heavy monsoon. That's why I love Malaysia, because it's always a rainy, wet race, and you never know what's going to happen. It's so awesome. The drivers had barely covered 100 miles of track, and according to FIA rules, only partial points were awarded. Despite the unusual circumstances, Button was now two for two racing for Braun GP. By contrast, before the 2009 season, he had only notched a single career win in eight seasons. And now, he had three. It was an amazing ascent for the British driver, who former teammate Jacques Villeneuve had once dismissed as someone who, quote, should be in a boy band. <laughs> nice. Yeah, Jensen Button, good looking dude. Yeah, man, he's freaking, that's why he's still, they're like, still got him on TV. The fourth race of the season in China was also contested in wet conditions, and this proved to be advantageous to a young Sebastian Vettel racing for Red Bull, who had a Senna-esque ability to drive in the rain. He was very good. People kind of count him out now because he's had a very crappy 2020 season at Ferrari, but he was able to win for the energy drink-based team. Uh, its first ever F1 victory proving that Red Bull, in fact, does give you wings, but Vettel gives you wins. <laughs> Uh, despite the victory for the young German, Braun also had a very strong showing. Button and Barrichello had finished third and fourth behind the two Red Bull cars, meaning Braun was still well ahead in the point standings. Very cool. 
The situation was dire for the other teams, however. Flavio Briatore, the outspoken principal of Renault, mused that the season was over and that F1 fans had better, quote, listen to the radio and watch something else. He criticized Jensen as a washed-up driver and call it, called him a par- paracaro, the Italian word for a concrete post. That's rude. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. It was some awfully Forza language, but it only amused the Braun team, who had gone from scrambling to stay in the sport to sitting atop its rankings in three short races. A lot of good insults in this one. A Muppet and a concrete <laughs> post. Dude, th- Oh, that guy? He's like a freaking concrete post. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that, I mean, that is good. pretty creative. The magic season seemed like it couldn't end for Braun. In the next race in the desert of Bahrain, Lewis Hamilton proved why he was, you know, Lewis Hamilton by setting the fastest lap time in qualifying. Unlike Braun, McLaren Mercedes was using a curve system, and the McLaren car finally seemed to be taking full advantage. As Jensen caught up to Hamilton on the first lap, Hamilton deployed his curves, bumping him from 185 to 190 miles per hour. (laughs) But it wasn't enough. Oh, man. (laughs) By the second lap, Button's superior arrow overwhelmed Hamilton's car, and he held on to the lead for the remainder of the race, a full seven seconds ahead of Sebastian Vettel in second. It was a far cry from the beginning of the season when Ferrari had offered Braun use of their engines. In fact, Ferrari, in particular, had failed to score a single point in their first four races. It's worst ever start to a season in the team's entire F1 history. <laughs> yeah, until this year. Well, yeah. no, because Charles Leclerc, he scored some points at Austria, I believe, the first race. I think he got third place. For the next race held in Barcelona, Braun's one-off sponsor was Terminator Salvation. Oh, man. Sick. Arguably one of the worst Terminator films. The movie was all about puny humans battling against killer cyborgs in a post-apocalyptic hellscape, a modern update (laughs) of David and Goliath. But Terminator had nothing on the real-life David and Goliath story playing out on the track. In the true story, Apocalypse of the Great Recession. (laughs) Kind of a stretch. In the true story, Jensenator. (laughs) Bronpocalypse. (laughs) The only wrinkle was that Braun was looking more and more like a T-800 robot in its own right, demolishing the rest of the field Grand Prix after Grand Prix. In fact, at Barcelona, Braun was so far ahead of its competition that the main storyline emerging from the race was conflict within the Braun GP organization. After a crash and a race start, it was decided that Button would take only two pit stops for the race, while his teammate Barrichello would take three. Button cruised to his fourth victory in five races, but his Brazilian teammate was furious. Barrichello had driven faster laps and was convinced that the team was favoring Jensen, even though they were equals in teams of seniority. I think, I mean, I I probably probably should have watched this race. Uh, But yeah, a team will do that. They'll 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 give different drivers on their team different strategies to cover their to cover their back usually. So if Barrichello had three pit stops. He's going to have newer tires by the end of the race. And with Jensen Uh only on two, that means his tires, no matter which compound they use at that second pit stop, his tires are going to be a lot more worn by the end of the race. So Uh if if the car falls off in pace, you have the fresher tires and Barrichello was driving faster. It was possible that he could have leapfrogged Jensen. It's the same reason that that. The two guys who know the recipe for Coke don't fly on the same plane. It's not really like that, Joe, at all. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> one of them, if that plane crashes, then the other guy who took the bus... Oh, yeah, I guess, I guess still, that does make sense. ...can still yeah. deliver the recipe. Ross Braun and Nick Fry played down Barrichello's frustration, but there was an ingredient to consider in Jensen emerging as the team's top dog. Braun and Fry flew back to England from Barcelona on a budget airline full of British F1 fans who've been attending the race. They're like the Bernie Sanders of uh, F1. <laughs> yeah. It was part of their effort to make cost-cutting a part of the team culture, but Fry recalled enjoying the experience immensely. Surrounded by adulation, he wrote of the fans that it was abundantly clear they were regarding Braun GP as first and foremost a British team. This was hugely enjoyable for me. We'd spent years brainwashing our staff back at Brackley that they were part of a Japanese team. And a Japanese family. Showing them videos of the birth of Honda. It was always hard work. 
But now, we didn't need to think like that anymore. We had a British driver in Jensen. We had a major UK-based company on board with Virgin. And another British family-owned sponsor in Henry Lloyd. While we weren't waving the flag in an overly nationalistic way, it was clear that this was a very British effort. Well, it's just well done, James. I just want to say that. Well <laughs> yeah, done. this is one of my better performances. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a great speech, though. Dude, like these British, like higher up car race guys, or maybe it's just like all race guys. Like, I feel like all these race guys are just so quotable. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, a lot they're of these guys. on PR. Yeah, like, they're just so eloquent. If you're a good racer, if you're if you have a good racing program in any mm-hmm. motorsport, you're probably a very sh- like sharp guy. Yeah. Yeah. While Fry's description of the team sounded like an outtake from the King's speech, who could blame Barrichello for feeling a tad miffed that the damp squib his mates had cocked up for him? He was pissed. After the Spanish Grand Prix came Monaco. It was another dream race for Button, who started in pole position and dominated the entire race. The only glitch came after the race, when Button finished and parked his car in the wrong place, not realizing the podium finishers were supposed to pull up to the main straight in front of the grandstand. Undeterred, he jogged down to the track to the cheers of the crowd to claim his trophy from the Prince of Monaco. Uh The metaphor was perfect because Button was on a historic run for the season. Five wins and one third place finish in six races. Amazing. It was the best F1 start since Michael Schumacher in 1994, 15 years prior. Ooh. The press and the rest of the F. The press and the rest. The Ooh, press, the and, press the rest. and the rest of the flesh. Yeah, yeah. I got the press and the rest in the flesh right here. The press and the rest. <laughs> the press and the rest of the. <laughs> the press and the rest of the F1 field were starting to treat Button as the world champion in waiting. The desperation started to show. One day, Nick Fry received a call from none other than Ron Dennis, the legendary Ooh. former principal of McLaren. I love me some Ron Dennis. Although Dennis had retired at the beginning of the year, he was still active within the team, and he was calling with a huge request. He wanted to know the magic number. Bronze aerodynamic coefficient. It was tightly guarded knowledge and something that would never typically be shared across teams, but Fry and Dennis both knew the situation was unique. McLaren was partnered with Mercedes, and Mercedes had provided the engines that were powering Braun's current domination. Now, indirectly, Braun owed Dennis and his team on some level. Fry reluctantly divulged Braun's numbers to Dennis. The reaction was stunned silence. Clearly, McLaren's own numbers were way off the mark. Dude, Dude. do you know, you know that Ron Dennis had to clean his driveway after he heard those numbers? Because he puked. (laughs) (laughs) Why was he in his driveway? (laughs) Because his... Why well, his wife um, doesn't like him to do work after like 8 p.m. Because he yeah. just, if it were up to him, he would work 24 hours a day. It's hard for him to shut off. Yeah. So he was like, he was like, hey, oh, I left some cream in the boot of the Jaguar. <laughs> Don't want me cream to go bad. Don't want the cream to curdle, do we, love? I'm just going to pop on out, grab that cream, <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Meanwhile, events were underway that could determine the fate of Braun GP beyond the 2009 season. Everyone understood that the team's current model was unsustainable. Companies like Ferrari and Red Bull were worth billions of dollars, and although Braun was competing and even dominating for the time being, it was on the coattails of hundreds of millions of dollars of Honda research and development. In terms of sponsorship dollars, the contrast often reached the point of absurdity. For instance, at the Japanese Grand Prix of that year, Braun was sponsored by a medical grade shampoo called Scalp D. <laughs> that also, Scalp D also sounds like a member of Gorillas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, what's up? My name's Scalp D. Thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. This holiday season, the best deal in wireless can only be found at Mint Mobile. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. Mint Mobile lets you safely order from home and maximize your savings with plans starting at just $15 a month. But seriously, I've been using Mint Mobile for a couple months now and I think it's great. I get service everywhere, it's super cheap. Compared to like my old wireless bill, it's great. And right now, Mint Mobile's best offer of the year is here. 
For a limited time, buy any three month plan and get three months for absolutely free. Free fitty. The reason that Mint Mobile is able to stay so affordable is because they're online only. That means they don't have a brick and mortar. They don't have a little shop next to Panda Express that they're paying rent to. That means they pass the savings on to you. Every plan from Mint Mobile comes with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And the best part in my mind is that I can use my normal phone that I've had for a couple years now. I don't have to switch to a new phone and spend time transferring contacts over. You can use just your phone that you already have. You don't have to buy a new phone. That's great. And if you're not 100% satisfied with your service from Mint Mobile, they have you covered with a seven day money back guarantee. So switch to Mint Mobile and get a premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. So if you're ready to switch for a limited time, buy any three month Mint Mobile plan and get three months for absolutely free by going to mintmobile.com slash gas. That's mintmobile.com slash G-A-S. So go on and cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month over at mintmobile.com slash gas. Thank you, Mint Mobile. Just want to thank our sponsor again this week, Manscaped, and their stocking stuffer campaign going on right now. Lots of great products that could be stocking stuffers this holiday season. They got the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Cleanser Body Wash. I really love that stuff. Highly recommend it. They also got the Crop Mop Ball Wipes. That's great for a laugh. But you know what? A laugh can also be very practical. Keep it in your wallet. You never know. They also got the foot duster, foot deodorant, you know, for your grandma, whatever. And let's not forget the lawnmower 3.0, the ultimate stocking stuff for this holiday season. Give the gift of trimmed body hair. You know what I'm saying? Who doesn't want that this year? The Lawnmower 3.0 features a replaceable ceramic blade with advanced skin safe technology. It's also got an LED light on it, comes in very handy. Uh, it's probably my favorite feature of the lawnmower because it helps reduce grooming accidents. I endorse it. It's a good product. It's well built. It works awesomely, I will say. Okay, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't used this thing because I have. It's great. So get yourself a lawnmower 3.0 for you and your loved ones this holiday season. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com with code GAS20. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code GAS20. Be the ballsiest gift giver this year with Manscaped. Thank you, Manscaped. Always a pleasure. The crucial meeting came in May when Fry met with Norbert Haug of Mercedes-Benz for what he thought was a routine engine supply related meeting. Halfway through, Fry casually mentioned some potential investors Braun was meeting with. Haug dropped a bomb. Mercedes might be interested in purchasing Braun. Mm, okay. Given that Mercedes had been with McLaren for the past 14 seasons, it was potentially a shift that could change the whole landscape of F1. The change was partially a result of Ron Dennis's announcement that McLaren was interested in developing consumer cars. If that happened, Mercedes would essentially be funding its own competition. Very interesting. And as we know now, McLaren is definitely on their feet when it comes to that sector. They make a lot of cars. And what's kind of interesting is that they, what's kind of interesting uh, is that they all, all the cars use the same engine. It's a twin turbo four liter V8. That engine is kind of known for starting on fire, right? There's been some issues. Uh, I've definitely heard from people who own supercars that uh, the McLarens are not the most reliable of machines, unfortunately. Our old office used to be near a McLaren uh, yeah. service station, so we'd always see McLarens on the back of uh, flatbed trucks. I thought it was because they were being delivered, but after getting those those uh, that information, it, it sounds like they're just getting towed there. Saw a couple of Senna's. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I love that Senna. I actually really love the 720S. That's like my favorite. I like the 720S, and I like this. Yeah. I think it's a 765 long tail. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the 720S has just like big old hips. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a it's a spaceship. Uh, 720S, that, it's a car with a lot of talent, all right? <laughs> <laughs> very, uh, let's just say it's a very talented car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Meanwhile, after a sixth win at the Turkish Grand Prix for Jensen Button and Braun, the team's hot streak finally cooled as the F1 season reached its midway point. Sebastian Vettel won the British Grand Prix. It was a disappointing homecoming result for the proudly British team, and Button finishing sixth with uh, Barrichello in third. They were still one and two in points, but Red Bull still had enough races remaining in the season to mount a challenge. The race exposed the GP001's Achilles heel. The car performed poorly in cold weather and struggled to maintain grip in high-speed corners. Very interesting. 
Uh, you kind of see the same thing um, with uh, Mercedes this year and in previous seasons. Their car does not do well in hot weather. The brakes uh, have a tendency to overheat, um, and it doesn't do well when it's behind other cars. Hmm. So it used to be behind other cars. How gangster yeah. is it to design a car to uh -huh. be in front? Like, you're yeah. like, I know this car is so bad <laughs> that we don't even account for it being behind other cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, what do we, yeah, what if we just avoid that? Uh, if I was like an F1 designer, I would simply design a car to not be in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From that point on, what had started as a can't-lose season turned into a war of attrition, with Button and Barrichello often fighting in the middle of the pack, trying to score enough points to maintain their lead over the other drivers. The lack of funding for the team was starting to expose the cracks in the organization's game plan. Button's car especially was not performing at the same level as the first half of the season, but the technical team was stumped as to what was causing the drop-off. The British driver's low point came in Belgium at Spa, which is my personal favorite F1 track, where he got into a four-car accident in the first lap that ended his day early. Although Button was still in first despite his first retirement of the season, feeling everyone catching up must have caused its own set of anxiety. Yeah, I can't really imagine that. Meanwhile, his Brazilian teammate, Barrichello, was getting into the zone just as Button was leaving it, recording wins in Spain at the European Grand Prix, as well as the Italian Grand Prix. The season would come down to the second-to-last race held in Brazil at Interlagos. Button had a chance to finally seal the world championship title that he had been limping towards, and Braun GP could secure the Constructors' Cup. Button held on to place fifth in the race, enough to secure both titles as he sang, We Are the Champions, over the team radio as he took a victory lap. Button and Braun had indeed paid their dues, and despite some sand kicked in their faces, had kept fighting till the end. A team that hadn't existed months earlier was now Formula One champions in their very first season. The 2009 season would also turn out to be the only season for Braun GP. Mercedes would indeed buy the team, purchasing a 75% stake for a rumored price of around 110 million British pounds. Ooh. It was an incredible return on the investment of just one pound that had been paid for the team a year earlier. Braun remained on as the team principal for another three seasons, but the team would no longer share his surname. It was rebranded as Mercedes GP. Button was not hired back. As world champion, he was asking for a premium salary, but the team leadership was not convinced that his driving put him in the top tier. Still, whatever tier he was in, he was now world champion for life, an incredible achievement regardless. It was only after Braun left that the team truly hit its stride, going on to win six world championships in a row as AMG Patronus. By the time you hear this podcast, Lewis Hamilton may have already clinched a seventh. Braun GP's legacy at Mercedes actually illustrates what a fairy tale Braun's 2009 season truly was. Before and after, the biggest billion dollar teams have employed the fastest drivers and built the fastest cars and dominated the sport. Like in so many races, it was a crash that fully changed the landscape. No one would ever wish a financial disaster like the Great Recession of 2008 upon anyone. I'm over it, obviously, but it was exactly those economic conditions that kept Braun's pitch for a management buyout from Honda from being laughed out of the room. Even if the story had ended with the team's formation, it would have still been remarkable. But with Button at the helm, the team went on to win in 2009, beating out those billionaires and showing that even in the mega corporate era and world of modern F1, miracles were still possible. For anyone who's disheartened by Mercedes' nearly decade-long domination of Formula One, keep one thing in mind. Without Goliath, there is no David. Without the recession, there would have been no Braun GP. Humans have a way of rising to meet any challenge in incredibly surprising and inspiring ways. We can certainly think of some challenges we're facing right now in need of a scrappy underdog to take them on. And who knows, maybe one day that underdog will be you. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm sure uh, Honda was involved in the negotiation, but uh, can you imagine buying, like ceremonially buying uh, like a team for a hundred dollars or a dollar? Then selling it for 110 million pounds. Yeah, like, that's pretty amazing. Like what? And like not paying Honda, and like Honda's just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So after Braun, he went to drive for McLaren. Uh, they did a little switcheroo. Mercedes went over to <laughs> Braun, and 
Jensen went from Braun over to McLaren. Uh, he stayed with them for seven years. Um, so after his championship, uh, his career was a little meddling, you know, a little mid, mid-tier. Um, he did finish second in the championship in 2011 at McLaren Mercedes. But then he was kind of like a midfield fighter. And then, of course, in 2015 and 16, that's when McLaren really felt started to fall off hard. He finished, uh, yeah, 15th and 16th. Pretty bad. And now he's racing in uh, sports cars. He did win uh, the Super GT Championship over in Japan in 2018. Yeah. Um, and you know, he, he's just doing it, man. He's living his, his best life as a, as a world champion F1 driver, a uh, very cool guy. And I think I, th- you know, it sucks that they didn't think his driving actually got him the championship, but I think to come back from that, like we said, he, he came from 18th to world champion in one year. I think that deserves some credit. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening to Past Gas. I always love doing Formula One stories. There's a lot more of them out there for us to get into. And on that note, thank you so much. This has been Past Gas. I'm James Pumphrey. Follow me on Instagram at James Pumphrey. Follow Nolan at Nolan J. Sykes. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow Donut at Donut Media. Um, if you don't know, we have a YouTube channel, Donut Media. <laughs> YouTube.tv slash Donut Media. Uh, no, we shirts. don't actually have that. We don't have that. What is ours? Uh, let me read it to you. <laughs> we could just go to YouTube and search for Donut Media. We have like four and a half million subs right now. We'd love you to be one of them. Our channel URL is youtube.com slash channel slash UCL6JMIMXK0XS. <laughs>